Uh, our next presentation is by Kitware Mac Dawkins, talking to accessibility of open source AI platforms for marine science. And uh, Anthony Hoogs is also on the panel today. All right, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. My name is Matt Dawkins, and I'm a software engineer at Kitware, a small software company headquartered out of upstate New York. And I'm here today to talk about Viame, which is an open source toolkit that we're currently developing alongside NOAA Fisheries and a couple other collaborators. For those of you not familiar with Kitware, we make open source software in a few areas. Being open source, most of the software is free to use and available on sites like GitHub. Some of our more well-known software is CMake, VTK, and PowerView. Anyone who's built other computer vision software like OpenCV or PyTorch have probably encountered CMake, which is used to generate cross-platform builds on Windows, Linux, or Mac, but it's also widely used outside of computer vision. We're headquartered in upstate New York, but have offices in North Carolina, DC, New Mexico, and Lyon, France. So what is Viame? Over time, it has evolved into a do-it-yourself toolkit that biologists can use to generate their own machine learning models with little or no programming experience, now in either web or desktop interfaces. We have recently also added support for an online repository for storing imagery and related annotations with additional support for training models. Some of its current use has been on the, the first three items on the left of the below figure, particularly object detection and tracking, um, but more recently, we've been expanding its capabilities into stereo measurement, image enhancement, registration, 3D model generation, and a couple other fields. Lastly, it provides tools to assist with the evaluation of different algorithms. People have begun applying Viame to a diverse range of data and challenging problems. For example, here are images from underwater downward facing cameras pointed at the seafloor. Many of these problems require the collection platforms to apply their own illumination and necessitates running image enhancement prior to automated detectors. Aerial surveys are also fairly popular, so you can see a diverse range of climates here with different types of seals and sea lions, all the way from the Arctic on the top to warmer climates in the middle, for example, off the coast of San Diego. Scene segmentation has also come up with a few groups, such as on the right, for classifying land cover into different categories. Outward facing cameras are a bit more diverse than the others, with a large range of different sensors targeting fish populations around the world. Tracking objects frame to frame to avoid duplicate counting typically becomes more important here, but that depends on the application. These might be underwater onboard fishing vessels for electronic monitoring or just, you know, GoPros trapped to penguin heads. Just to give you a feel for the assortment of platforms collecting this imagery, there's a large variety. Some are towed vehicles with a fixed cable to the surface and others are more autonomous, such as AUVs. All of the, um, the aerial ones we've worked with so far being um, mostly manned fixed wings, but a small amount of UAVs which we're going to get involved with. Planning for Viame began in late 2015 with the formation of NOAA's AISI committee. The development picked up a bit more in 2016, 2017. AISI was created with a representative from each fishery science center around the US and also a couple of members of industry and university partners. Viame wasn't the only product funded by AISI, but it was originally designed as an integration platform. But over time, it evolved into a full do-it-yourself AI toolkit with multiple workflows for generating different types of classifiers or detector. The more traditional approach is in the middle. The user has some raw data, they do a lot of manual annotation on them, then train a model. The second is when you already have an existing model more similar to what you're trying to do, either from someone else's work or first pass model trained on your problem. In these cases, it might be more helpful to, to run the existing model and correct the annotations as opposed to doing them from scratch. The last workflow involves, involves low shot learning and video search to rapidly generate a model. There are different types of annotations that the annotator interfaces support, box level, pixel level, frame level, and key points. Each are useful in different circumstances depending on the application and user time available for annotation. Additionally, we have now uh, developed a couple different interfaces. The newest, Dive, is shown in this video, which can be run either on the web or on desktop. Dive supports multiple types of annotation in addition to model training on multiple sequences and we now have a, a web version of Dive hosted online at viami.kitware.com that contains a couple million annotations. Then there's additionally some more specialized desktop applications in addition to Dive, including search for rapid model generation, seal for multimodal annotations, for example, on infrared and thermal simultaneously. Um, and lastly, we have project folders for bulk processing data in bulk from bat scripts outside of interfaces. I'm now going to give you a very quick feel of some of the capabilities in Viame, but I'm not going to linger on these slides too long. 
And on the detection side, we've done some high level integration of, of algorithms in wider use in the computer vision field. But what, then we've done some optimizations on top of them, such as fusing in motion information into these detectors or depth maps. Um, similarly, ensemble classifiers for taking multiple detectors and running them in parallel. Um, this is a quick example of our interactive learning uh, for rapid model generation, where the user provides only a few samples of the target, then the system searches a, a database for additional um, things that match, match that target in terms of appearance similarity, returns those results to the user, the user annotates what was right and wrong to rapidly generate a new model um, for the query of interest. You know, enhancement comes up in underwater a lot, but one of the things we've been doing is coming up with 3D models um, based on camera calibration and stereo cameras, and trying to infuse those into detectors for improved performance of buried objects, such as flatfish that might be covered in sediment. Now, registration comes up in a few domains for aligning imagery, um, especially in aerial. We might have lower F frames per second data, like one hertz data, um, that might only lap by 50%, but you still don't want to duplicate count um, different seals or sea lions. Now, object tracking also comes up in a few domains, and one object tracker doesn't always fit all problems. So we typically have a um, uh, like one tracker dedicated for fish type problems that runs at higher frames per second video, like 10 hertz, 15 hertz data. Um, but then we might have lower frame rate registration based trackers for some of those aerial sequences. Now, stereo measurement, similarly, we have two different approaches, one for when you have lots of annotations, so head tail points on what you're trying to measure. Uh, and then a non-deep learning approach when you don't want to rely on having lots of annotations. Now, the same thing's true for full frame classification where we have our rapid SVM model that can be trained on few annotations and then sort of a deep learning sort of standard just ResNet based model for when you do have lots of annotations for problems of interest. People here are looking for typically full frame properties such as background um, information or whether or not an event is happening in a video such as in those penguin feeds. Lastly, we have embedded processing. A lot of people, they're fine taking their data to their lab, um, but we've also started doing a bit with um, detectors right downstream from the camera systems itself and running it on, on embedded hardware, low swap hardware. Now, some of the future steps for Viyama include um, trying to get it working on more types of data sets, for example, acoustics. Um, and lastly, I just wanna thank you know, NOAA CFF for funding Viyama, that's been instrumental. Um, and, image annotators across multiple organizations who have contributed annotations to it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Matt. Um, and uh, we have a question for you and Anthony. Uh, I guess I think you should get the prize for fitting the most into a five minute talk. There's, probably, <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done to tease apart all of the questions. And even I'll leave one of the technical questions to Matt and I'll take a 30,000 feet stab at a question for you. Um, you mentioned about the AISI community and, and how this had, had helped the development of, of the system for work teams in America. Can you give us some insights into how that, how that rolled out and, and what worked and what didn't and who funded or how you managed to get people to work together or talk together and so on? Um, just a little bit of an insight into how your world worked out. I'm looking for you on the top shelf here to put you down. Thank you. All right, so thanks, I guess, for inviting me here today. Um, so the AISI committee was, was founded with one representative from each of the Fisheries Science Center. I wasn't on the original committee. Uh, Anthony was, who's, who's also available on this call. Um, but certainly that helped um, begin the process of getting annotations. A lot of people in the beginning, they didn't have many annotations for their problem. Uh, some of them did. Um, you know, when you're doing traditional deep learning methods, you typically need a lot of annotations. You know, it's not a small amount when you're coming into a new problem. Um, so one of the, the original goals of the AISI committee was to sort of combine the people who had a lot of annotations with those who didn't, who were just starting out for the first time. And I think so uh, having contacts there really helped a lot of, um, bringing together people who had lots of experience for, for a problem and those who didn't, who may have just been coming into this raw, who had never heard of convolutional neural networks or deep learning. No, I, th I think that was very helpful. Anthony, could you add to any of that about the history of story about how the community sort of took off and how that helped? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so back in 2014, uh, Noah had 
NOAA organized a workshop at the um, National Research Council, which is part of the National Academies of Sciences and Engineering here in the US to try to bring together the computer vision community with NOAA fisheries folks. Because even back then they knew that computer vision could help them. They had people dabbling in this across the different science centers and they wanted to coordinate those efforts and bring in researchers who knew how computer vision works. This is way before computer vision and deep learning popularized uh, AI around the world. And uh, it was really ahead of its time. Uh, and they had organized this initiative, which came with funding uh, from NOAA to give out to various researchers. And then some of that came to Kitware for Viami development. Some went to UC San Diego for CoralNet development. Others went to different universities and labs. Uh, this was coordinated and allocated through the AISI. Uh, so it was really very visionary. And because of this, the, the NOAA team that put this together and ran this for years under Ben Richards, who's one of our co-panelists uh, not here today, um, they won the, the gold medal for scientific achievement, the highest award in the Department of Commerce in the US uh, back in 2019 uh, for this effort. Because it really predated this huge wave of, of AI usage and acknowledgement and the position fisheries such that it's way ahead of the game here. Now, Viami exists, fishery scientists have been using AI and computer vision, uh, some of them for years. Uh, so it's really, I, I, I really hand my hat to, um, to these NOAA folks who put it together and thank them again for funding Kitware to do this work. It was really uh, uh, quite visionary. I'm going to hand over to uh, Anton and, and then Matt will probably hit you with a real technical question. Thank you. Um, sorry, I have no real question here at the moment. No. Okay, Matt, go ahead. Um, yeah, kind of a, a technical question. Uh, what's the biggest challenge that you faced rolling so many dimensions into one package because you're really your coverage of many different aspects such as thermal infrared you know sift uh, slam image stitching you've got so many components in that one piece of software it's, it's such a mountain i think you've managed to climb and, and putting it together and making it um, accessible to users as well, I think, is, a, is something that's really commendable. What, how did you approach doing that? I, I definitely think that's one of the challenges we faced. Um, typically, there's not one workflow that works for everyone from the get go. A lot depends on, you know, how long the user is going to sit down with a particular problem, you know, how long they're going to spend doing annotations um, for these problems, you know, that, that might control which type of workflow they want to do. Um, how big their lab is, you know, for example, if there are four people sitting who want to do co-annotation at the same time, in which case a web solution might be better, or if they're just one researcher um, who has access to GP resources, you know, they might just be fine working on their, their desktop. Um, that's sort of what's led to us having a lot of different workflows for these algorithms and adapting it to, to some of these different problems. Um, and so I guess, been, sorry, and what's been the, the user uptake like? How, how many users do you think we've had that are using it proactively uh, for analysis? It's probably estimated a couple hundred right now. Um, I, I think on our, our line at Annotator, we have roughly 400 users who've signed up. Uh, a lot of those people just signed up to get annotations. They're not active users, but looking at the past 60 days, there's been about you know, 320 or so active. Um, we don't actually have a feel for how many people who have downloaded the desktop version. There's, there's no statistics for that, um, but I guess there's something similar there. Um, to follow up on the question about you know, where all this, you know, adding all this functionality in, um, as Matt mentioned, Viami has been under development for five years or so, I mean, we're more, um, we maintain the capabilities that are there, but then new capabilities come along because there's enough interest across NOAA centers that, uh, that we use uh, the NOAA maintenance and improvement funding to, to add them in. So when there's a capability, let's say stereo, reconstruction from stereo cameras producing a 3D depth map, something like that might be of interest to multiple centers, so we might add it in. We also have additional little efforts that are funded uh, through uh, NOAA centers directly or anyone else who wants to, to pay for something to be added to the AMI. So we've had a few of these where we've added in 
of significant detectors, enhancements for detecting certain kinds of, of um, items in the sea, like scallops. Uh, so the, the capability keeps growing um, and we try not to delete things or make them uh, obsolete, not working anymore. So it does just keeps getting added in. One thing we don't have is reinforcement learning. Uh, it'd be interesting to put to put something about that in there for various problems, uh, but uh, that's on a to-do list. Well, thank you very much for that. I think we could.